Hey, and welcome to you, friends. Let's get right into it. I know uh, folks are anxious. First of all, I, I, we've got a lot of comments, a lot of views so far uh, tonight, and that's awesome. I love the passion for the Word of God, um, knowing that God has the answer correct and that we are just His students, right, and the clay that He is molding. Um, so with that in mind, let us continue, in my view, a very, very simple procedure to get the truth of the matter uh, behind what we call the rapture. So Pastor Jake last week um, led off with you know, his experience in this, and tonight I'm going to show, I'm very confident, uh, that we will prove why the rapture must be after... There are words that the scripture uses that matter, like after, like first, like last, like keep. So we're going to go through those now with all the associated scripture references on your screen. All right. So no worries <clears throat> about that. So let's get going. And just so you all know, we're not be taking questions. Okay. In the chat. So please save your fingers and, uh, Realize this is just going out to everyone widely. All right. First of all, it's important to know where I came from in this. I certainly was not born uh, believing what I do today. I did not become a Christian believing what I do today about this topic. Um, I even was brought up, you know, through teenage years into my 20s, not believing what I currently do about this topic. So it's not as if I was raised and, and this had been drilled into my mind and I am totally unteachable. Um, real quickly, I was raised Catholic, uh, but I always had a great love of the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. Not that we ever covered those things in church, uh, but I did always love reading them even as a child. Uh, and so at one point there, I left the Catholic church and I just went to my local library, for those of you who remember that, what those are, uh, and checked out every single end time book that I could find. And I'm not joking about that. Uh, I just devoured the the subject, and what I found was in those books that all the quote unquote smart people believed um, that it was a pre tribulation rapture. So I believed it. So for three years, I not only believed it, but I told my whole family about it. I told anyone who would listen about it. I said, "We've got to get ready. It could be any moment. It could be any month. It could be next month." There was even a book that I read who had a specific date for it. So I was hung up on that. And we even have seen that tonight in the chat. So I know where you're coming from. It, it, there's, a, there's an urgency there, which I like. I think that's great to have that urgency. Um, but going through it and just... You know, going, we never understand every little detail. Some things just stuck out and uh, didn't quite make sense to me. And basically, one day God just asked, when I asked him, hey, Lord, will you just clarify this for me? He basically asked me, what makes you better than them? Better than the original apostles. Better than Christians in the first century. Better than Stephen who gave his life better than Paul who got his head chopped off better than any generation of believers in the past 20 centuries. What makes you worthy to escape the same things that they've been enduring. And by the way, the other question that stuck in my mind always was which Christians are Christian enough to be raptured anyway? Because all I heard was, well, every Christian is going to go, but then in the same breath you say, well, this denomination, they're not really Christians. That denomination, they're not really Christians. Well, somebody's really, really wrong there, right? So who gets to go? Who's Christian enough? So these things were always sticking with me. So it was time to go back to school. By the way, that was not a picture of me, but similar. It was time to go back to school. And thank God, it turns out it was actually very easy to understand this subject when we let God speak for himself. 
Example one. Last means last. Can we agree on that? When you say the word last, it means nothing happens after that. It's the last one. To wit, the last trumpet. 1 Corinthians 15. Here is the scripture. I'm going to cover a sliver here, but you want to read basically from chapter uh, verse 12 all the way to the end. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. That means I'm revealing a mystery, okay? He's not giving you a new mystery. He's revealing an old one. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So I think Annette actually mentioned this earlier when we let off the service tonight. There are two groups here, the dead Christians and the ones who are still alive when Jesus comes. And we are all changed at that time. For this corruptible body must put on incorruption, and this mortal body must put on immortality, can't die. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal put on immortality, then, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, Sheol, the grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Why would he tell us to do this? Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. In the Lord, be steadfast and immovable. Because one day we'll be changed, but not till the last trumpet. First Thessalonians chapter 4. These are the rapture verses, are they not? But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. Again, talking to the brethren, the Christians, okay? To a church, this was written. Just like Corinthians was written to a church of believers. This is to a church of believers. Don't be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep. Again, what does to be asleep mean? They're dead. So that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and I hope you do, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. In other words, those who have died as Christians. They come with Jesus at this event. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This is the Lord's word, not Paul's word or an opinion, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, the last trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. It doesn't matter if you're alive when he comes or you're dead in Christ. We're still going to be gathered together when he comes at that last trumpet. And we see what happens when the dead have come to life. And we're changed together. Paul continues in 1 Thessalonians 5, do not make the mistake of your um, chapter division in your Bible. Those are artificially inserted. This is a prime example of when you should not pay attention to that. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 are the same thought. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. In other words, when does this gathering happen? What is the time and the season that the dead will be raised and we are gathered together with him in the clouds when he returns? When is that time? He said, you should know this already. You don't need me to write to you. Yourselves already know perfectly well that the day of the Lord 
so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, but they shall not escape. You, brethren, are not in the darkness so that this day should overtake you like a thief. L listen there. He just says he comes as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord comes as a thief. But those of you who know the times and the seasons will not be taken by the thief. It won't come upon you like a thief. You won't be surprised because you know it's coming next. There cannot be a surprise rapture. It won't be at any time. The day of the Lord will be well known that it's on the way. Those who are watching will know the order of events. And what is it? He just says, what happens first? Peace and safety. What does that mean? Israel has to shout peace and safety because they've made a contract, a covenant, a deal with the Antichrist and the surrounding nations. It's a peace deal. They will be shouting peace and safety, but then suddenly the Antichrist invades. That all must happen before we can talk about the day of the Lord. And Paul is already saying, I don't even need to tell you. You know this already. You shouldn't even be confused because you are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor darkness. In other words, the thief comes in the night, but we don't have to worry about that because we know. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, sleepily walking through the world, not knowing what things are coming when, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath. This is a big one, right? That People who believe in any time rapture will tell you, well, of course he didn't. Not a point as to wrath, but what about the rest of the sentence? But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the two states of humanity, saved and lost. Either you are saved by Jesus or you're under the wrath of God. Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together. Just like in chapter 4, he's talking about those who are dead in Christ before he comes, or those of us who are still alive when he does. We got together. Alive forever, resurrected. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are doing. Little known fact, Paul was quoting the book of Daniel. Daniel 12. 1 to 3. Now listen. What does he say? Peace and safety come first, and then suddenly it comes? At that time, the times and seasons, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands who watch over the sons of your people, Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble. Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah. Such as never was since there was a nation of Israel, even to that time. Be the worst things that's ever happened to the Jews. And at that time, your people shall be delivered after the time of trouble. Everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Well, didn't we just read about that? The resurrection of the dead. Some to everlasting life. Now, how do we get everlasting life? Paul just said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the others to shame. An everlasting contempt. There are two resurrections, turns out. There are other scriptures that say that, by the way. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. Why brightness shining like brightness? Like the sun, because it's daytime. They're children of the day. Paul just said that. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Eternal life, immortality. So, what does last mean? Last means last. We just saw it. First Corinthians 15 says the last trumpet. And what do we see? A 
comparison, if you go back to verse 12, which we didn't cover, it'll be too long. Flesh versus resurrection bodies. That's all what 1 Corinthians 15 is about, two bodies. When do we get the new body? We don't get it if we're going to heaven. We get it when we come from heaven at the second coming. That's the last trumpet. The last trumpet is the seventh. How do we know that? Uh, Revelation 8 through 11 says there are seven trumpets. And Joshua chapter 6 demonstrates that there are seven trumpets prophetically. The last trumpet is detailed in Revelation 10, 7 and Revelation 11, 15 to 19. It has a name. It's called the mystery of God is finished at that time. What's the mystery of God? The church. The one new man. Fullness of the Gentiles has come into Israel. That's the end of the church. That's the end. That all the believers that will believe have come in. That's the mystery of God. That the Gentiles can now come into the children, the kingdom of Israel. Romans chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 2, both say that. 1 Thessalonians 4, as we just saw, the dead in Christ come with him. Come with him. So when he's in the clouds to take those of us who are alive and remain on the earth, the dead are with him. Why would they be with him if they weren't coming back? Because they got their new bodies already. It's for the earth. It says we're caught up together. doesn't mean us living with us living. It means the living and the dead are caught up together. That's the gathering. That's what the rapture is biblically really called, the gathering to Christ. First Thessalonians 5, as we said, the same thought from chapter 4, the same time is the day of the Lord when the wrath of God happens. Wake or sleep will be together. Again, the connection of whether you're alive at this time or whether you're dead in Christ, we're going to be together. And we have that same mon um, thought in Daniel 12, being asleep or being awake. And it was after the time of great trouble for Israel. So you can't have any trumpets after the last. Remember that. Even if you remember nothing else and you totally disagree with everything you hear, pray on these things. Lord, show me how last doesn't mean last. It does. He's not trying to fool you. How about the opposite? First means first. Not too hard to grasp, right? What is that? We're talking about the first resurrection, as we dealt with uh, earlier with Annette as well. So what's the scripture on that? Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6. I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. This is after Jesus returns, right? Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they came to life. The dead came to life. The dead don't come to life until the seventh trumpet when Jesus returns. And who is included in that? Ones with who wouldn't worship the beast and get the mark of the beast. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years are finished. That's exactly what Daniel 12 just said. But the rest of the dead did not uh, till it was finished. This is the first resurrection. The ones who came to life at the beginning of the thousand years when Jesus returns. That is the first resurrection. You cannot have a resurrection of believers before the first. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death, now we have two deaths as well, not just two resurrections. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hallelujah. So let's take a look at who these guys are who are in the first resurrection. The first meaning the first. Can't have one before this. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. I want you to pay attention to something that they're wearing 
And they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and offend, avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. By the way, can't you hear that today? You don't think our brothers and sisters in Iraq, Saudi Arabia, North Korea, China, Nigeria, on and on, those who are being killed for their faith, which is happening every single day, they're crying out to the Lord, how much longer until you avenge us, till you take justice to the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, listen, brethren, right, who would be killed as they were was completed. Look at Revelation 9, uh, 7, excuse me. Now, look at the similarities again. After these things, I looked, behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. You have to be a martyr to get a white robe at this point. Don't you? You have to be dead. Like, you died on the earth, not raptured, died in heaven. Died. They are clothed with white robes. But wait, I thought the great multitude was the, this great party of raptured saints. No, it's nowhere in there. It says raptured. They died. There's a great multitude because there will be a great martyrdom. And I believe this is counting up the martyrs from all the ages. Clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation. No, not how long, O Lord. Now it's salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing, glory, and wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, and power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these? Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? Hmm. And I said to him, I don't know. Sir, you know. He said to me, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. How can one come out of the great tribulation if you were not in the great tribulation? <laughs> uh, you can't. They had to have been in it. So you see, I don't care what you think you know about the rapture, it ain't happening until people are dying in the Great Tribulation. Which you should know, we all should know, any prophecy student who, you know, class one of prophecy teaching is the Great Tribulation is the last three and a half years of the age. So they had to be there to come out of it. The first resurrection includes all Christian martyrs who were killed during the Great Tribulation. The first resurrection includes them. Revelation 20 said it. Just saw Revelation 7 says it. Now, when does this raising of the bodies come into play? Uh, Jesus spoke on this, did you know? John chapter 6, verse 39, 40, 44, 54. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Oh, forgot to underline that. At the last day. And this is how the will of him who sent me, this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 11. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. 
Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. But Martha said to him, I know, Lord, he will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. Amen. So when does the resurrection happen? Well, it can't happen before the first one. Revelation 20, first resurrection includes those beheaded in the Great Tribulation. It says that. Revelation 6 and Revelation 7, the white robes are given only to martyrs. John chapter 6 and chapter 11 means the resurrection happens on the last day. Jesus the Christ, your Lord, said so. <laughs> so that's the rapture. Now that we know, hopefully, that last means last and first means first, how about the word keep? I will keep you, Revelation 3 says. Now, this is, to my experience, uh, this is the prime answer or first defense, first line of defense for someone who says, oh, we can't, the rapture's got to be any moment. Because Revelation 3 says he will keep me from the hour of temptation oh look at that i'm just looking in the the uh comments and there it is here you go omar i know your works see i have set before you you can't just take one verse look at the whole thing i've set before you an open door no one can shut it for you have a little strength you have kept my word and have not denied my name there's something to that fact keeping his word because you have kept and i can even have done it the sentence above that too kept my command to persevere the word kept is toreo you have kept my command to persevere i will also keep toreo you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one may take your crown. Why would he tell us to keep his word, not deny his name, keep his command to persevere and hold fast if he's going to take you away before? The word keep doesn't mean remove. Keep you means like you keep his commandments. To keep his commandments, does that mean to remove his commandments from your life? Of course not. Here's the definition. Go look it up. It's a verb. In your Strong's Concordance number G5083, it says to keep watch over, to guard, to observe. How can... Look at Revelation 3 again with that understanding in mind. To keep you from the hour of temptation means to keep watch over you in the hour of temptation, to guard you in the hour of temptation, to observe, to watch you. Don't believe me? Look at the same word talking about the same event in John 17 where Jesus himself is praying. You think tereo means removal from the world? Because it says, I'll keep you from the time of trial or temptation that's coming on the world you think that means take you away from the world look what jesus says but now i come to you and these things i speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves i have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as i am not of the world i do here it is i do not pray that you should take them out of the world but you should keep toreo them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. That's the way you get kept from the world. You don't get removed from it. He specifically prayed that you don't get removed from the world. Example two, Revelation 16. Apply this take away. Uh, nonsense of a definition to this sentence. Behold, I am coming as a thief, which we just heard from Paul. Blessed is he who watches and keeps 
Toreo his garments. Would you want to throw your garments away? Remove them from yourself? Would you call that keeping your garments? Or does it mean remaining clothed? It means remaining clothed. Lest he walk naked and they see his shame to be shamefully exposed. Toreo does not mean to go away to heaven or to remove from the world. It means watch, guard, observe, persevere, keep my commands. That's what it means. The same word in other contexts using the Gospels to keep the commandment. Go look it up. Do a word search on Toreo in the New Testament. Keep my commandments. Keep the commandments. Keep my word. Keep the Sabbath. You cannot in, in any way massage that to mean removal from the earth. It means to keep. <laughs> to observe it. To do it. To protect in the midst of the world and the enemy. Same word, same context, John 17, 15. I'm telling you, I go to this constantly. Just say, if you're in a battle over this and somebody brings up Revelation 3 and that, and they don't want to hear that what Tereo means, go look up John 17, 15. Jesus says, don't remove it from the world. What is, is, is his prayer going to be answered? Yes, it is. Revelation 3.10 is the exact opposite of a rapture to remove us from the earth. It's the opposite. Keep means keep. After now means after. I hope we're being clear here because God is being exceptionally clear. After means after. After the tribulation, for example, Matthew 24, Mark 13. Let's take a look. Uh, in a minute, we'll take a look at that. But look at 2 Thessalonians 2. What does it mean to say after the tribulation? Now, brethren, again, brothers, sisters, Christians to the church of Thessalonica. The church concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's the rapture. We ask you, do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by a spirit or by a word or by a letter, as if it was from us, the apostles, because it's not. As though the day of the Lord had come. The day of the Lord was understood to be the return of Jesus when he gathered his saints to himself. That day will not come yet. It is not today. It is not tomorrow. Why? Apostle Paul, who has direct experience on the road to Damascus with the risen Jesus, says, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, capital D, the what? Day of the Lord will not come the gathering to Christ, the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him. That day will not happen until, number one, the falling away comes first, the apostasy, the great apostasy. And two, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exhausts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God in the temple of God, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember when I told you these things when I was still with you? First Thessalonians, he said the same thing. When I was with you the first time, I already told you how this all goes down. It's not going to happen right away. We've got to have the peace and safety part. That's this. Then comes what? The great falling away and the Antichrist sitting in the temple. Nobody, nobody in any interpretation, no, no theory that I've ever heard, puts the Antichrist being revealed and sitting in the temple in Jerusalem before the final seven years. Of course not. 
Doesn't make any sense. By the way, the reign of the Antichrist, the Great Tribulation, is what causes the Great Falling Away. Because there's a false prophet on the scene performing miracles that you're not ready for. I'm not ready for. Without the Holy Spirit, you will not endure. You will be deceived. Even the very elect would be deceived if it were possible. You know now what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. The restrainer withholds this time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Who is that? We read it in, already in Daniel 12. Michael, the great prince of your people, when he stands up, when he removes his protection, then Satan is cast down and the Antichrist does his Antichrist thing and sits in the temple of God in Jerusalem. Revelation 12 says the same thing. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Do you see what happens at his coming? The, look at verse 1 and then verse 12. Verse 1, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. We all love that image, right? The Lord's coming on the clouds. We are gathered up together with him, whether living or dead. We're gathered in the clouds. Hallelujah. But also at his coming, he destroys the Antichrist. How is that the rapture? That's before the tribulation. How is that before the tribulation if the Antichrist is killed at this coming? How's it before anything? Seems like it means after. Matthew 24, 15 to 28. This is referring to Daniel 7, 8, 9, 11, and 12. All together. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is just what Paul talked about, the Antichrist sitting in the temple, right? The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. That's the temple structure. There's a outer court, inner court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, right? That's way back in the Torah, guys. It's a physical building. When you see this abomination standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. That means get thou to the book of Daniel. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. By the way, I wrote a book called Fleet of the Mountains because of this verse. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight to the mountains may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. This is quoting Daniel chapter 12. This is referred to directly in the book of Revelation about these uh, martyrs that come from the great tribulation and those who suffered and were beheaded take part in the first resurrection. And unless those days were shortened, in other words, ended, no flesh would be saved at all. But for the elect's sake, those days will be stopped, cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. As I just mentioned, the false prophet is the tip, is, typifies this. Great signs and wonders, just like Revelation 13 says, and Paul says as well, to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms. Don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the carcass is, the eagles will be gathered together. When the Lord comes, everyone will see him. When we are gathered to him, 
Everyone will see him. He's coming to destroy this one who brings on this great tribulation. Matthew 24, 29, what happens after the tribulation? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the great one, in other words, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's what happens after the tribulation. That's called the day of the Lord. There is no time of peace after that. There's no rest for seven years. There's no rest for anything. It's here. Matthew 24, 30. What happens after that? Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, the seventh trumpet. And they will gather together, rapture, his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Oh, it sounds like the dead from heaven. We see this also in Mark's gospel, chapter 13. In those days after that tribulation, the same one he just told you about, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers of heavens in the heavens will be shaken. And then the coming in glory, verse 26. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Do you, are you picking up on this constant re reference to the clouds and his coming on the clouds? Because we're raptured to meet him in the clouds, right? Remember that? It's to tie in the verses together. To say, is it the same event, guys? This is what I'm talking about. Then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now that's an extra detail. That means the dead and the living are gathered together and not till the end. Now let's look at Luke 21, the often forgotten chapter about the end times. And there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on earth distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then what? Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, what things? The signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars? After the tribulation is ending. When those things happen, lift up your heads. Because your redemption draws near. The redemption of your body. The resurrection. The rapture. The coming of the Lord. Not when you see some sign seven years before. When you see the signs in the heavens. After the tribulation, then you know the day of the Lord is here. Then your redemption is near. Everyone sees him coming on the clouds. Why does he come on the clouds? Why does everyone see him do that? It's not a secret. It's not a disappearing act. It's not a U-turn. Everyone sees him coming on the clouds. He returns to what? To sit on David's throne. David's throne in Jerusalem and judge the nations. That's why he's coming. That's why he leaves heaven. Look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, the nation of Israel, unbelieving Jews, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. That's Revelation 1.7. That's also referencing Isaiah 40, verse 5, Daniel 7, 13, Zechariah 12, 10, and Acts 1, 11. All say the same thing. After means after. We have just showed you from the scriptures, not from imagination, not from opinions, not from a video on YouTube. 
the scripture itself, the rapture event is not possible until after the Great Tribulation. What happens to the Great Tribulation? The abomination of desolation is seen, which means the Antichrist is in the temple. Jerusalem is invaded, Luke 21. The armies, when you see the armies surrounding Jerusalem, then you know its desolation is next. Right? Jerusalem invaded, which means Jacob's trouble, the greatest time of trouble in the history of Israel. That's what Daniel says, that's what Jesus says, that's what Paul says. The Bible is agreed. And the great falling away happens. What does that mean? The great falling away of Christians from the faith. Mass denial of Jesus by Christians. This is what Annette talked about at the beginning of the broadcast and what we are harping on, I personally am always harping on, we are not ready to see the amount of Christians that will deny Jesus when there's trouble. The Bible says it will happen and it will be massive. It is impossible that the rapture event occurs until after the sun, the moon, and the stars. Those signs happen. They begin the day of the Lord. As Jesus returns to the earth in wrath, you're not subject to the wrath of God? That's right, because when he returns, you're in immortal bodies and you're on the team. He's not fighting you. The wrath of the Lamb. Did you know that's what's called in uh, Revelation 6? Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. The day of the Lord Jesus in another place. I didn't go into all these, but there's many more scriptures on that. After, folks, means after. And finally, the end means the end. He who endures to the end will be saved. Not seven years before the end. Not three and a half years before the end. Not one year before the end. The end. Matthew 24, 3. As we start or end where we started. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? What did he just say? That the temple will be destroyed completely. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And the end of the age. The end. What will be the sign of the end of the age? First, he says, he goes through all these signs in the beginning of that process. Not the end, but the beginning of sorrows. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And uh, through verse 7. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Christians, he's talking to you. And kill you. Isn't this, the, I, I love how plain spoken Jesus is. He's such a beautiful God. No secret formulas. You don't need a doctorate. There's no Bible code, okay? You will go through the tribulation and you will be killed. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Not because you're a nice guy. Not because you root for the wrong football team. Because of me. Because you hold my name as yours, Christian. And then many will be offended. Many what? Many Christians will be offended because of what's coming on the earth. They'll be offended at God for sending them tribulation. How dare you, God? I thought you loved me. I thought you loved your bride. How could you let her get beat up? Is what this ridiculous statement that many, of, unfortunately, you listening have said. Thank God I never said something so dumb. They'll be offended at God. They'll betray one another. Christians will betray each other. And will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Maybe ones who say, hey, you know what? Jesus is already here. Yeah. His name is Isa, but he's, he, that's Jesus. In 
and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, be everywhere, the love of many Christians will grow cold. These are all tribulation facts, okay? But he who endures to the end will be saved, shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom is coming, the tribulation comes first, that we must endure to the end. That gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come, endure till that moment. By the way, I think this is just some uh, things about end times and, and death and destruction and martyrdom. He says it in a different way at the very end of the gospel, Matthew 28. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of the nations, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Endure to the very last day of the age. That's what certain translations of that verse say. The very last day of the age. The last day. What happens in the last day, John chapter 6? The resurrection. The Holy Spirit will be with you the whole time. There is no removal of my church. You're always here till the very last day when I come. Jesus will be with us as we take the gospel to all the nations, ending it where it all began in Israel. The end of the age cannot come until the Jews of Jerusalem call for him. Did you know? And this is the emotional climax of why the rapture issue matters why it's a big deal that it's not at any moment why it's a big deal that it can't be before he is counting on us jerusalem jerusalem the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her are you willing to endure that how often i wanted to gather your children together That's why the rapture is called the gathering, friends, of his children. As a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. And surely I say to you, you shall not see me again. Until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we know that's a prophetic psalm awaiting fulfillment. Remember when we said you'll be witnesses of all to all the nations? Lord, when he's about to ascend to heaven, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because the apostles know that's what's next. The king is here. The Messiah has risen from the dead. And now it's time for Israel to be restored. And he said, it's not to, for you to know the times or seasons because you, Peter, John, and the rest, you'll be dead. This is for a generation still to come. It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall, you standing right here, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's the Great Commission, right? Witness means is martus. Many of you know this already. You will be my martyrs in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. 1 Corinthians 2.7. We referenced this in the beginning. 
The wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, but now is revealed. What plan was previously hidden that is now revealed that will lead to the seventh trumpet? The plan was the opening up of the kingdom of Israel to the Gentile nations, whosoever will, the church. Israel will call for Jesus and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord at the seventh trumpet. We know this because it says the tribes of Israel shall mourn when they see him coming with the clouds. They will know, Zechariah says, that they are the ones who pierced him. And that is the end the end of the Gentiles being grafted into their kingdom. Every Jewish person who has not been killed in Jacob's trouble, those who obeyed Jesus and ran to the mountains, who are cared for by those Christians who were just simple enough to obey and shelter them, provide for them for those seven years or those three and a half years at the very end. Every Jew who survives will go to Jerusalem and call for him to come. Then all Israel will be saved. And it's not a joke. It's not a figure of speech. He's not trying to fool you. Every Jewish person will be saved on that day. The dead will come back to life. That's Romans 11.15. Paul says it explicitly. What will happen when they receive the Lord Jesus but life from the dead? When they accept him, the bodies themselves rise out of the graves. It's time for the resurrection because the resurrection and the life has come back. Okay, before the last trumpet slash first resurrection, we must know and understand that there is the entire three and a half year Great Tribulation. Revelation 12 tells us plainly what? That the tribulation is not God's wrath. It is Satan's wrath against the Jews and the faithful church. Say this again. I don't care if I'm going on for an hour and a half. The Great Tribulation is not the wrath of God. The Great Tribulation is not the wrath of God. It is the wrath of Satan against the Jews and the faithful church. The mature, who is the faithful church? The bride who is matured to the point to be willingly killed, martyred to ensure not their family's survival, not their town, not their country, to ensure Israel's survival. That's what mature Christians will do. They will shine like the bright lights of the firmament, like stars forevermore, when the Jews of Israel see that they are willing literally to die for them. They must call on him. If you want Jesus to come, if you want the rapture, if you want the resurrection, then get ready to receive the Jews. Who will flee? Preach to them. They must call on him. And they will literally save the nation by doing so. Because if they don't, like Jesus says, no flesh will be saved. Satan would kill every last one of us. So... Back to the beginning, what did I learn? Remember, I went back to school. What I learned was this. 
the last generation of the church, whenever that is, is no better than the first or any generation in between. We're not better. We don't deserve better. Nothing different will happen. Persecution, suffering, and martyrdom for the name of Jesus has always been with us and will be until the very last day of the age. The desire to escape is of the flesh. It is not from God. Your desire to be in comfort, your desire to sit in heaven and watch things unfold is from the enemy. It's not what a mature Christian attitude is. And it is not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Word of God says over and over and over and over in so many ways, in so many contexts. If you want to save your flesh, can't be my disciple. We're not talking about the same things, Jesus would say. I don't know what you're after, but it's not following me. If you're planning on escaping and getting away from the bad times. The hard times. Last slide, I promise. The rapture or gathering to Christ's scriptures are not there to frighten us, to endure to the end. They're to encourage us to endure to the end. It's our Father's heart. These scriptures are given for us to grow in our faith in the midst of trial and trouble. The promise of his coming and our gathering to him is the anchor that we can hold on to tightly the anchor of our hope, the living hope. He's coming, our resurrection, that day, that great day, and terrible for the world. That day is what we hold on to tightly. Let us all love his appearing for that day. Yes. Remember, Jesus told us, you will, you will be hated by all names, nations, by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And so we've come to the end. <laughs> Why the rapture must be after. If you must rewind and just go back and make it simple, see what the scripture says. Last, first, keep, after. Words matter. And whether it's the rapture of subject or anything else, God is not out to fool us. Uh, let me pray together with you. Father, enlighten our minds. Give us courage. Give us the simple understanding that you would have a child understand the scriptures with. Because we know, we know you are not trying to complicate this for us. You know how simple we are. And so you've made it simple. And you repeated yourself so often. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, because that's how we learn. Put it in our mind and heart, the heart of the Father, to see many come to repentance, that none should perish, and that none should desire to flee away from trouble, but to run into the fire, because you're there with us. And you're there at the end. And you're there now. So bless us as we go. Keep us, teach us. Even if this is a hard lesson, Father, I pray that we may all come to one understanding of this crucial topic in all the world. Every Christian may be agreed in Jesus' name.